Welcome to Earth, a love story. I'm your host, Robin Lassiter. Lately, I've been thinking about all the different kinds of work that I've been doing, and I've been trying to come up with a way to lay it all out for folks. I finally remembered that I have a podcast, so I thought I would do a quick little episode talking about all the things that are present in my life right now. A couple of years ago, this image came to me. It was a Venn diagram with three circles, and one circle said something like trauma, dysregulated nervous system, codependency, addiction, all that fun stuff. Uh, The next circle said ETs, NHI, OBEs, otherworldly experiences. And then the third circle said the earth, the goddess, the feminine, my physical and emotional body. And I know it was just me creating that for me, but it was such a relief to see that little graphic representing these large parts of who the fuck I am. It helped me make sense of myself. And this was before I had finished the book, before I had fully story told myself into being. So it was a big deal for me to see this Venn diagram and be like, okay, that's me as a person right now in my life. And now, a couple years later, which feels like a couple lifetimes later, I want to share with you what that looks like in my everyday life, and then talk about one of those circles that I haven't overtly brought forward much on this podcast, and that circle is the last circle, which is namely the goddess. But first, the other stuff that is really present in my life and where I'm currently devoting my resources and love. I'm the low-key community manager for the Experiencer Group, and the Experiencer Group is a private online community for experiencers, uh, people who've experienced anomalous events of all kinds, and are looking for a safe place to learn and explore. It's a really amazing place, And it arrived into my life when I really needed support and framework around all of the crazy things that were happening to me and that have happened to me since childhood, but suddenly the volume was turned up. I needed a way to make sense of it. I needed a framework. I was there on day one of the doors opening in this virtual space, the experiencer group. And I remember feeling like I had stepped into this oasis this sort of calm place where people were talking about all the things that I wanted to talk about. And then eventually I got the courage up to attend the Zoom meetups uh, where people shared personal experiences. And when I started attending those and sharing, I would just like sweat and cry and (laughs) shake through my shares. Uh, But eventually I stabilized in this really safe community and Um, Pretty quickly, I started volunteering for the site. Ultimately, I became really good friends with Jay Christopher King, who is uh, one of the founders of the group. And now we work together to create a really nice place for our members, other experiencers. So some folks in the space have had prophetic dreams or have seen a ghost or had some event of bizarre high strangeness, have seen a UAP or a UFO, if you're old school like me or who have had outright contact with non-human entities. Some folks are channelers or mediums, or have had near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences. People who have undergone events that don't align with consensus reality are people who find their way to our little nascent, growing community and find support. And we leave room for everyone's belief systems. We're not dogmatic, and we don't pretend to have the answers to this great mystery. We do ask really good questions, though, and thoughtful, intelligent, kind people who find and offer support through weekly online meetings and dream study groups and ask me anything with amazing thought leaders in this field uh, and more. And we want to create a really positive anomalous culture. And that's what's been happening. It's a really cool space. Um, People apply by answering a few questions and we vet everyone who comes through the door so there are no trolls. We want to make sure that this place is really safe and we do a lot of work to curate and cultivate a certain vibe in the group. And that work is basically 
deciding who we let through the door in a way that feels both very inclusive and very protective of our little community. So after answering a few questions, if the person is vetted into the group, there's a two-month free trial period that's both for us and for the members to make sure that we're a good fit for them and they're a good fit for our community. And then after that trial period, folks can continue on for a small monthly fee. It's a cool, amazing space. And if anybody's interested, I'll put uh, the experience or group info into the show notes. Next, (laughs) you didn't know this was going to be just me marketing, but don't worry, there's a story coming. I just need to say all of this. So I, you know, don't listen if you don't want to listen, but these are things that I want to get out in the world. People ask what I'm doing, and I don't know how to answer that question in three words. So that's what's happening here. So next, I teach locally. I'm teaching at a local yoga studio uh, using the framework of yoga to teach some other things to me that are really valuable, like somatics and parts work and things like that, through the framework and lens of a yoga space and community. So I teach locally and I also teach online. I do one-on-one sessions and most of my work is around helping people cross the threshold from a rational materialist framework, basically from a consensus reality framework into an enchanted, alive kind of animist landscape. And don't worry, we keep the rational piece. Like humans have worked very hard to become logical and rational beings, and we don't get rid of that. In fact, most of the work that I do is about uh, bringing in and integrating and developing capacity to hold more rather than exiling or cutting things out. There's a place for that, but it's all done with love and with the idea that we are becoming space for life to move through and that we hold more. We can hold more paradox multiple things at once, like grief and joy, um, the mundane and the magical at the same time. So that is most of my work, but many of my clients are working on other things like how to balance personal belief systems in their inner life with their regular nine to five job that is in consensus reality world. And they find very fulfilling and important. So again, we're not trying to get rid of any of that, just seeing how we can integrate things together. Um, some people come to me to tap into more creativity or, and this is a pretty common one. Maybe there's just this kind of vague, but urgent call sort of ringing away in the background, keeping people up at night, consuming this psychic energy and vitality. And people don't know what to do with that. They don't know how to answer the call. And I help them answer the call and approach the thing that's trying to come through. It's really tender Uh, beautiful, profound, courageous work, and I love it. I also work directly with experiencers who are trying to figure out how to find both the grounding and the magic in the forever liminal space that seems to take up a large portion of our interior landscapes. I use a combination of coaching and somatic work and guided hypnosis, and I have a huge toolbox of a variety of spiritual Uh, sometimes prosaic frameworks. So all of that to say, you can reach out for a free discovery call anytime by visiting honeyheart.org. And now uh, this is the part that I really want to highlight today. There were two main groups and teachings that helped me cross the biggest threshold of my life to date. And I'm going to write a whole thing about that. I haven't really talked about this specific experience that was that big threshold crossing. It was, you know, it it was something that felt like death, like I died and didn't die. And the first group that really helped me with that is the experiencer group where I found the framework and support that I was talking about earlier and also found mentors and helpers. And the second group of teachings that I found were the maiden to mother teachings, this maiden to mother work, which is led by one of my teachers, Sarah Durham Wilson. And I found Sarah's work several years ago. Uh, She's on Instagram and I would watch reels of her speaking and storytelling. And I was typically laying in bed 
nursing a nasty hangover and wondering if I would ever be somebody who could do something important with my life uh, or if I would just forever be consumed by my deep need for acceptance and being with men who weren't good for me and going through heartache after heartache and having, you know, booze and cigarettes and all these things just be a part of my normal life and a tremendous amount of suffering. So I found her when I was in that space and continued to follow her and be inspired by her work. And years later, as I was, um, you know, now sober, getting my life together, and as I was watching this big threshold approach, part of which was the death of the relationship that I thought would save me and make everything all right. As I was watching that unfold, I decided to take a leap of faith and enroll in some of Sarah's courses. And first was the Maiden to Mother course, which was literally life-changing. Literally. And then uh, I went through her teacher training and became a lineage holder for this work. And Sarah's work was born from the great need she saw to help women cross the threshold from the wounded maiden archetype into the mother archetype. Uh, When the wounded maiden is running the show, it's all about me. And when this archetypal mother arrives, it's all about we. And it's a move from transactional to relational, from what I was really, really good at, burning it down and running away in the night, to finding safety and strength for the ways that we need to change our lives. And mother here doesn't refer just to biological motherhood. Um, This is an archetypal mother that I'm speaking about. And talking about basically the divine feminine who has been down there in the dark. I call her the great round, the uncried cry holding it all and waiting for us to come down and bring to her what needs to die so that we can have the life that we want to have and that our soul is asking us to have. It's beautiful work. So I listened to Sarah tell me the stories of, um, tell me these fairy tales, like the little matchstick girl who goes from door to door looking in at the warmth and glow of other people's lives and she's selling the last bits of fire and spark that she has and she sells that for just a penny. She's selling pieces of her soul for just a penny and looking in and seeing all the things that she doesn't have and she doesn't know how to get out of that life. And she told me the story of the Handless Maiden, which is one of my favorites. It's too long for me to tell here and I don't know it well enough but I think it's in Clarissa Pinkola Estes' book, Women Who Run With Wolves, and it's an amazing story. So as this was unfolding, I started having dreams about the goddess, dreams about women, about these multidimensional women who were at all stages of life. I started to understand that I was parts, that I was a sum of my parts, and that some parts were kind of running the show and louder than others and some parts were in the shadows and some parts were stepping forward and wanting to to come through and um but the the biggest part that was running the show was my own wounded maiden she didn't know how to cross the threshold into a mature safe uh woman a grown-up and so That's what this work helped me to do. Um, Sarah also told the story of the descent of Inanna. And up until this point, I had never heard the story of the descent of Inanna, sort of this dark feminine mirror story of the hero's journey. And I'm going to tell that story here in my own words. This is my own retelling from the bones that Sarah gave me of this story. And from this really beautiful translation of the Sumerian cuneiform tablets by Diane, Diane, Diana, Diane, Wolkstein and Samuel Noah Kramer. I love this translation. Every time I open it, it feels like I'm stepping into this rarefied space where there's just this constant access to alchemy happening. It's, it's an amazing story and an amazing translation. 
So, without further ado, here is my retelling of The Descent of Inanna, which sums up all of this work for me. (sighs) So, Inanna, queen of heaven and earth, had all the things. She had beauty, and she had power, cleverness, status. Uh, She had just found her true love, Demutsi, and they had spent verse after steamy verse in bed together. Seriously, you should get this translation just to read about them in their marriage bed. It's hot. Um, So they stayed in bed together until Demutsi's desire was finally slaked. And then he was like, sorry, look, I got to go to work. I have to go to work. I have to get out of bed. You go to the court and you'll be like a sister to me and a daughter to my father. And this has been great and it's been amazing and I love you so much, but I have shit to do. So I got to go. So that's not really talked about a lot in this story. But for me personally, I love that detail. Because what Inanna decides to do instead is go down to visit her sister in the underworld. And she does it when the masculine turns away from her when he stops holding her and she needs to come into herself and um, sort of be whole unto herself. And so what she does is decide to go down to the underworld and attend the funeral of her sister's husband, Gugulana. That's when she goes down to meet her sister, Ereshkigal, who is queen of the underworld. And the Sumerian translation describes that moment with these three lines. It's the first verse of The Descent of Inanna. From the great above, she opened her ear to the great below. From the great above, the goddess opened her ear to the great below. From the great above, Inanna opened her ear to the great below. And when I read those three lines, they just rung me like a bell. There was something there. There was something calling to me. They still ring me like a bell. I love them so much. Anyway, Anana goes around and tells everybody that she's going down into the underworld. She tells all the fathers. And they all say, you're crazy. Don't go. Don't go down there. Nobody gets out alive. You have everything up here. You have everything. What? Are, why are you going to go on this crazy journey? You already have what everybody wants. You know, why would you risk it all to go down to the underworld? And she says, I'm going, I'm going into the underworld. And that's one reason I love this story. There are so many tellings, like I want to say myth, but these things to me, I think myth is a word that makes it sound less real and serious and entwined in my inner life and psychology than it actually is in other stories. Um, like Persephone, for example, she is dragged down to the underworld. This is the only story that I know of where the protagonist, this woman, Inanna, chooses to go down to the underworld. She hears a call and she chooses to go. She opens her ear to the great below. So she tells her waiting woman, Nimshabar, that if she's not back in three days to send help. And that's always a moment where anyone who's gone down on an underworld journey sort of chuckles because if it only took three days, we would all do it all the time. Every weekend, we would just go do it. <laughs> but that's not the way that it works for the, the purposes of the story. She tells Nim Shabar, if I'm not back in three days, send help. So Anana journeys it down to the underworld and comes to the first of seven gates. And she approaches the gate, and the gatekeeper says, Why are you here? He says, the translation in the text is, Why has your heart led you on the road from which no traveler returns? Which is also beautiful. And Inanna says, I have come to witness the funeral rites. So the gatekeeper goes to Ereshkigal and says, You won't believe who's here. Your sister, queen of heaven and earth, is at the first of the seven gates. She wants to come down here for the funeral. And I think the translation of the text says something like, Ereshkigal bites her lip and slaps her thigh, which I take to mean like she's like, holy shit, I can't believe my sister showed up. Well, yeah, she can come, but 
she has to come the way that everyone comes to the underworld. She has to enter stripped of all the things that she has, all the things that she's acquired. She needs to arrive naked in my chambers. Let her enter bowed low. So the gatekeeper goes back and tells Inanna, you can come into the underworld, but you must give up the things. You know, you must give up the scepter, the crown, the robes, you know, that all represent these things that she's accumulated, the status, the cleverness, the security, the beauty, all of these things. She has to give each one of those up at each of the gates. And at each of the gates, Inanna protests. She says, no, I don't want to give this up. And at each gate, she is told, quiet, Inanna. The ways of the underworld are perfect and must not be questioned. When she finally arrives into Ereshkigal's chamber, Inanna is naked and scorched. She is bowed low. Ereshkigal fastened on Inanna the eye of death. She spoke against her the word of wrath. She uttered against her the cry of guilt. She struck her. Inanna was turned into a corpse, a piece of rotting meat, and was hung from a hook on the wall. That part of the story is always so shocking. So Inanna comes down to be with her sister for the funeral of her husband. And she walks into her chambers, and Ereshkigal slaughters her instantly and hangs her dead corpse from a hook on the wall. So, for three days and three nights, Inanna hung dead on the wall. And when she didn't return, Ninshabar went to the fathers. And she went to each of the fathers and said, Inanna went into the underworld and she hasn't come back and we need to send help. And they said, we told her not to go. I don't know what to tell you. She went down there. She's dead. That's what you get. Just stay up here where everything makes sense. Don't go on crazy adventures. Don't go down, you know, to visit the queen of the underworld. Don't do this shit. Uh, she got what she deserved. We're not going to help her. So finally she goes to Father Anki, who's the god of wisdom and of waters. The waters represent the heart. And he hears Ninshabar and decides to help. He takes dirt from underneath his fingernails and fashions the dirt into creatures that are neither male nor female. He calls them the Kurgara and the Galater and tells them that they must go into the underworld and meet Ereshkigal. And he gave them really specific instructions about what to do when they got there. So he says to these little creatures, you will find Ereshkigal in her chamber moaning and crying. And you can't tell if these are the cries of agony or ecstasy, if she is dying or giving birth. And when she cries, oh my inside, cry also, oh your inside. And when she cries, oh my outside, cry also, oh your outside. So he's basically telling them, go down and grieve with Ereshkigal. Go down and grieve with her. And so they slip through the seven gates of the underworld. They make their way, these little beings that are neither male nor female, they go in to Ereshkigal's chamber and they find her. They find her moaning and crying, and they can't tell if these are cries of agony or ecstasy. They can't tell if she's dying or giving birth. And she cries, oh my inside, and they cry, oh your inside. And she cries, oh my outside, and they cry, oh your outside. And she cries, oh my belly, and oh my back, and oh my heart. And they cry, oh your belly, oh your back, oh your heart. And Ereshkigal stops and looks at them. And she says, who are you moaning and sighing with me? I will give you a gift. I'll bless you. So the creatures went down and heard the cries. They tended to the uncried cries of Ereshkigal. They went down and sat with her in her grief and her pain and her wildness and her coming alive and her ecstasy and her giving birth. They went and sat with her through that. And as a result, she said, I will give you a gift. I will bless you. And the creatures ask for the corpse of Inanna. And Ereshkigal ultimately grants the wish. And then these little creatures go to tend to the corpse. And they sprinkle food and water on Inanna. And she returns to life. 
And so Inanna and these creatures are like, all right, let's get out of here. Let's get out of the underworld. Let's go back to the up above. As they're leaving, Ereshkigal stops them. And she says, no one gets out of here without leaving something behind. Something must die. Something must be burned away. Something must be left behind. That moment is the moment that the parts of us that were never ours to begin with, like the parts of us that were put onto us from our culture and the world and uh, our childhoods and all of these things that are no longer serving us, that's the part where we leave them to die. And they become compost for the thing that will be born. And it's a beautiful story and I love it so much. The other part of that story, which we don't focus on a whole lot, but I deeply, deeply love, is that Ereshka girl's like, well, give me Nimshabar. And Anna's like, no, that's my waiting woman. I can't give you her. And so she makes all these like suggestions. Well, give me this, give me this. And finally she says, give me Dumuzi. Then it's Dumuzi's turn to go to the underworld, to tend to the uncried cries, to grieve. And the beautiful, tender part of that story is that Dumuzi can't handle it. And so Dumuzi's sister does half of his time for him in the underworld. And then there becomes this cycle and season where half the year he's in the underworld and half the year he's not. And it's a perfect vision of this, you know, of the circle, the circle, the cycles, the seasons. And it tells us that we must continue to go down. We must continue to die to the things that no longer serve. (sighs) So beautiful story. And this story, more than any other, turned me into a woman. I stopped being a terrified little girl or a rebellious teenager or wounded maiden living in a woman's body. And I learned to tend to my own uncried cries. I learned to meet the great round Ereshka girl down in the dark and let the things die that needed to die. And it's all done with love that dark feminine calling us down. It's all done with love. And the goddess has a thousand faces. And she is what this work is about. It's about growing up, becoming safe for ourselves, then safe for the room, and then safe for the world. And it's about deconditioning from the systems and ideas that we took on in order to survive the overculture. And finding that we can survive standing in the flames of paradox. That we can hold both grief and joy... And it's about becoming the lap of the mother so that we can hold ourselves and the other. And it's about learning to die before we die so that we can live the life that is calling to us from our own bright bellies that looks different for each one of us. So this is my other public work and offering that I want to highlight. In mid-November, Sarah is guiding a new group of women through the Feminine Rites of Passage. And this is nearly a year-long journey that includes maiden to mother work and mother work and crone work and rites of passage work. And she's called in a council of teachers so that she's no longer holding this lineage alone. And I'm thrilled and excited to say that I am one of those teachers. And I'll be teaching uh, a section called Edging into Mother. And that is that moment when Inanna is no longer dead on the wall, but hasn't fully ascended back into the world. And it's this really powerful moment of the play of life and death and light and dark. And it's this liminal edge that feels just excruciatingly, rapturously alive. It's a really powerful, beautiful moment. Uh, I'm co-teaching with the vivacious and amazing Kayla Hill. And she's also bringing in the archetype of the mother lover which is the next iteration of the goddess with the thousand faces that is calling to me. If you're interested in crossing the threshold from maiden to mother or becoming a teacher in this lineage or in attending only portions of this teaching, all of those are options. Check out the link in the show notes. It's themotherspirit.com. You can find out information there. If you do decide to sign up, let me know. That would be uh, amazing. It'd be really amazing. And, um, yeah, sorry guys. Like that one is just for the ladies. Although I will say a healthy chunk of my clients right now are men and they're doing the same inner 
reclaiming, deconditioning, um, maturing inner work around archetypal father. And they're ultimately approaching um, mother work as well with just this tender, fierce courage. And it blows open my heart, gives me a lot of faith in humanity. I think we're going to get through this tough time that's coming up. Hope I'm wrong. It seems to be coming up. All hands on deck. There's only a couple more things. One is that I am in a Vajrayana Buddhist community that is where I do my deep internal work and I'm keeping that sort of sacred and close to my heart as I'm moving through teachings that feel very familiar to me. It's my spiritual home. I'm very grateful to be there and I'm not qualified to teach it and so I don't really bring it into my teachings but that's where my feet are right now my feet are on the ground in this really beautiful work that is my spiritual home Uh, I'm also teaching a group course hopefully beginning in January we'll see called the embodied mystic and you can join the waiting list um, for that by visiting my website and uh, yeah there's also another book percolating away in the background that I will need to tend to at some point when I have capacity. No idea when that will be, but I always knew I'd write a second book and it's, it's there in the background. So that's it. I'm fucking busy, you guys. And also I've never been happier. So I feel really resourced, really nourished. It's a really great time without these teachings and groups and communities and teachers, I would not have the clarity, uh, the courage, the spine, the practices, the support, um, the framework, the vitality in my body, the knowing in my bones. I wouldn't have any of that. I wouldn't have all of the things that I need just to exist and survive on this planet and and be living this life where I feel like I've won the lottery. I don't have a lot of money, but I live connected to the land that I grew up on. I live in this dome that I built for myself. I have these deep, beautiful relationships that literally span the globe. And my life before this threshold did not look like that. I sit at the feet of my teachers and I thank my teachers and my teachers' teachers. And I thank you. If you would like more information about any of this, please check the show notes. Thank you to Morgan Jenks for the beautiful soundscapes. If you would like to reach out to me, please visit honeyheart.org.